Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to part one of our six-part Eldritch Moon full set review. Today we're going to look at all of the white cards and some of the multicolor cards as well. So if you watch this series in the past, you know that we're going to look at every color in the color wheel over the next five days, and then on the last day we'll look at the rest of the set, which will encompass the colorless cards. Now, as usual, most cards in any given set are going to be more limited focus, so we're going to talk about those in a limited capacity. However, when we get to a card that potentially could see some standard or even modern play, we'll mention that and talk a little bit about that as well. Having said that, we got a lot to look at, so let's go ahead and get started. And our first card is Blessed Alliance. Now, this is a very good card. Whenever a card gives you a lot of options, and there's a lot of versatility, there's potential for some powerful plays. I remember back when Dragons of Tarkir originally was previewed, I was very drawn to the commands. I really wanted to get play sets of those just because I just felt that not only will they make good standard cards, but I did think that they could see play even in modern or other formats going forward, and so far it seems like that's the case. Now this card in particular might not be as powerful as some of the commands, but it does some good things. Now first off, the first mode, target player gains 4 life. That believe it or not, might be the most exciting mode here because of the way that it combos with another card in the set, Lone Rider, which we'll see in a few minutes. And that combo alone could make this standard playable. But on top of that, it does some other things and gives you more versatility. It's got a nice combat trick there. And then that third mode, which isn't always going to be great for you because your opponent's going to be attacking and they're going to be the one deciding which creature to sacrifice out of their attacking creatures. But if they only have one creature attacking or maybe a couple of big creatures, it could be a nice combat trick, big blowout combined with that and I'm tapping a couple of your creatures. So this card could be quite good. I'm really excited about it. I think we'll see standard play and it's gonna be a bomb for you in limited for sure. Next we have Borrowed Grace and it's another Escalade card. Now this one's a little more niche and I'd say that this is probably more of a limited card. However, if you're going wide and limited and white, you're gonna see as we go through these cards, there's a lot of token generation in here. You can get some Eldrazi tokens, you can get some Spirit tokens, you can get some Soldier tokens. There's just a lot of ways to get a lot of small creatures and that's where this card's really gonna shine. And if you happen to be playing Orzhov colors, for example, and you can go into black where there's a lot of zombie tokens, then a card like this could even be possibly better. So know your deck, obviously. This isn't always gonna make your build. If you're doing something that's a little more grindy and meticulous, maybe you're playing a more of a burn style deck, which you'll see as we get into red, or maybe a tempo deck in blue, or maybe you're just playing uh, a ramp deck, trying to ramp into some big Eldrazi's or something. This card is not gonna be something you wanna play, <laughs> but if you have a lot of tokens and you're planning on going wide, this will be great for you and limited. Now we're already up to our first meld cards. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about the legendary angels individually, and then we'll talk about meld a little bit so let's start with bruna the fading light now bruna is a little expensive i don't think she's going to get there in standard but this is a great limited card and i think also a fantastic commander card so as far as limited goes yeah she costs seven it's a little pricey sure but you get yourself a five seven flying vigilance and the fact that when you cast her you get to reanimate an angel or human from your graveyard right into the battlefield. So you're definitely getting your money's worth for that seven mana as long as you feel like your deck can get there. But really, if you have a card like this, you're gonna try to make it possible to get to her on your mana curve because she could just simply end the game at that point. Uh, fantastic card also in Commander because she combos extremely well with Gisela. And if you do happen to get those two cards on the battlefield and they do meld into the Voice of Nightmares, you got yourself a huge threat on the board right so this is the type of hijinks you want to try to pull off in commander that's what commander is all about is having fun doing just crazy huge creature magic right so these cards are fantastic there let's talk a little more about gisela uh, now she is the real deal you want to talk about playable and standard and probably even modern uh, she's there only costs four four three flying first strike lifelink forget the whole meld thing she is a beater on her own. She can just completely win the game on her own. She's a mini Baneslayer Angel. She's phenomenal. If there's one awkward thing about this card is it's the fact that it's mythic and you know it's gonna have a nice price tag on it because there's gonna be a lot of decks that are gonna to wanna to play her. I mean, just look at your white decks right now. Great four drop for those decks as you curve into Avacyn at the five spot. This card is going to be everywhere. This is probably gonna be the card of the set and rightfully so, it's really, really pushed. Uh, again, it's not about 
trying to get the combo to Melder when you're talking about standard or modern is just simply about putting a great creature on the battlefield. If you do happen to get her unlimited, well, congratulations. It's going to be real hard for an opponent to beat you if they can't deal with this card very quickly. It's just going to run away with the match. And hey, if somehow, some way, <laughs> you happen to draft both of these, which I don't know what the odds of that are, probably not real good, but you'll have quite a formidable deck on your hands for sure. Next we have Choking Restraints. This is good limited white quote unquote removal, basically a pacifism effect for three. But the reason you're paying one more is you do have a little more versatility. If you wanna pay two blue and three, you can then sacrifice the enchantment and exile the creature. What's nice about that is there's a lot of effects in this limited environment that you can put into play, but if you sacrifice a creature, you get a bonus. So this takes that ability out of your opponent's hands. You won't have a situation necessarily where they have a creature on the board that can't do anything anyway, so I might as well just sacrifice it and get more value. You at least have the option here as long as you have the mana to take away the value. And this is also a nice option if you just have a creature on the board that you can't get rid of. You're not really worried about them in combat, but you're worried about an effect or ability they have. This is another way to get rid of them for white. So pretty good for you and limited. Collective Effort, and here's another Escalate card, and yet another good Escalate card in white. And, you know, I'll address the elephant in the room. I know white has been kind of in control of standard for a while now, and it's just getting more and more pieces. And I think white is going to continue to be a very, very strong color as we go forward in this meta, and cards like this will make it possible. Now, the big story here, I think, is the Anthem effect, which is that third mode on the card. What's a little awkward though is you already have Gideon in the format, so Gideon also can give you an Anthem effect. However, even so, I still think this will see standard play, and I think it will possibly see even more standard play when Gideon does rotate out eventually. Uh, but having said that, you have the Anthem effect, but you can also deal with a problematic enchantment or large creature. Again, you're just getting versatility, it's just value for days. And I think it goes without saying that this is a big game and limited as well. Courageous Outrider, it's another good limited card, and they made cards like this in the past. I always really liked them. Uh, this costs four, you get yourself a nice three, four body, it's a very good blocker, but I think more importantly, it lets you dig a little bit in your deck, see if you can find another human to put in your hand, and it just ensures, for the most part, that you're gonna be able to keep bringing the threats. So this is a great card, especially if you have a lot of targets in your deck to hit with this. Don Griff, speaking of good limited cards, uh, this is a white Windrake, and Windrakes are good, so you'll be happy to play this in limited. Uh, you get the evasion for three mana, and can get some good damage in sometimes early in the game. Deploy the Gatewatch. Uh, this is a mythic. This one's interesting. Uh, now, where do you play a card like this? Well, the most obvious answer is Commander, right? Commander, you're just doing kind of the big battle cruiser magic. If you have a Commander deck with a lot of Planeswalkers, and I have seen Commander decks that are like mostly Planeswalkers, uh, this card is going to be great. You're going to get value from it. It costs six, which I think is very reasonable, considering that if you tried to cast two Planeswalkers, you're probably paying more than six in most cases, unless you're trying to play with a lot of Tibalts or something. Um, but this is a very economical card in that regard. I think it could see some standard play. There are some Super Friends style decks out there, like in Naya, for example, that I think could try to shoehorn a copy or two of this in and it could get some value out of them. It just depends on how efficient it ends up being in the metagame. Uh, but it could happen. Now, unfortunately, it's kind of a dead card for you in Limited. You're not really going to be playing this even in draft. You'd be very, very fortunate to even open one Planeswalker, much less more than one. Uh, so it's not going to hold a lot of value for you there. Uh, but obviously, there are places for this card. Next, we have Desperate Century. And this is a fine Limited card. It's not always going to make your cut. It's a lot better if you can hit Delirium. So if you have a deck and you're pretty confident you can get Delirium, it's probably worth running. If you don't feel that great about Delirium, it's not quite as good unless you're really desperate for a playable. I can see this being more playable maybe in Sealed than Draft, where Draft you just have a better pool after you've Draft, hopefully, <laughs> if things went well in the Draft. Uh, but I, I could see maybe playing this card a little more frequently in Sealed. Next we have Drogskull Shieldmate. Uh, this is a good limited card. I like this a little bit better than the last one, just because for three, I'm getting a two, three body this time around. I like that a lot better. Also, I can flash into play, and also it buffs the toughness of my creatures till end of turn. There's a lot of versatility here. I do like this card. I can see myself playing this quite frequently, actually, in limited. 
Next we have our first transform card and it's Extricator of Sin, which transforms into Extricator of Flesh. This is actually a pretty fine limited card. Here's what I like about it. It's a little awkward if I play this on turn three and I get myself a zero three and there's nothing I really feel comfortable sacrificing. But as long as I can sacrifice another permanent, even if it's a land or just something, a small creature or something else, now I'm getting myself three five power toughness on the board for three. That's actually quite good. And then when I get Delirium, which Again, I don't necessarily feel like I have to have this Delirium Engine to make this card good, but as long as I'm playing Magic and I have maybe some artifact creatures in my deck or something like that that's going to help me at least get there by the mid to late game, I feel pretty good about my chances of flipping this card. And then you just have yourself a nice little 3-5 Vigilance creature, and more importantly though, you can pay 2 and tap to get yourself 3-2 token, uh, which is nice if you have extra lands later in the game and you just want to go in for that kind of Alpha Strike. I, I like this card. Again, it's probably not going to make all builds. It's just going to depend on what other cards it's competing against, but I think it's a pretty good limited card. Next, we have Faith Unbroken. Uh, this one, I'm a little torn on. It just kind of depends on the deck I'm playing in limited. Here's the downside. The downside is it costs four. It has a journey to nowhere effect, which I really like. I love that card, for example. However, this is a lot easier to get rid of because basically you can get rid of it either by getting rid of the enchantment or the creature. The creature is probably going to be relatively easy to get rid of. There's a lot of removal in this set, as you'll see as we go forward. So uh, that alone kind of makes this card very fragile, very easy to get two for one, for example, which doesn't feel good. However, if I'm playing a tempo deck, you might just want to look at this like a tempo play that I'm going to flash out a creature that's a problematic blocker. I'm going to give one of my creatures with evasion plus two plus two. I'm going to attack in, and if the creature ends up dying by the end of the turn or next turn, well, I still got my value out of it. I think if you look at it that way, this card might make sense in some limited uh, Azorius builds, for example, where Azorius is just going really deep with some of the tempo in this set, as you'll see tomorrow when we look at those cards. Uh, but this isn't a card I'm comfortable playing in a lot of limited builds, but uh, occasionally I could see myself using it. Next we have Faith Bearer Paladin, and this is a card that combos well, again, with a card we're going to see in a few moments here, Lone Rider, which is a very strong card, but more so this is really a limited card, and it's a great limited card. 3-4 uh, Lifelink for 5 is actually very economical, get yourself a nice little blocker, and if you can gain some life in the exchange, not a bad deal at all. Fiend Binder. At first glance, this one looks a little pricey because you're saying, well, I want to pay four for a 3-2. That doesn't feel real good. But the upside here is pretty strong. I and mean, whenever you attack in, you get to tap a target creature the defending player controls. That can be quite strong, especially if you have like a couple of these out on the battlefield at any given time. Uh, so again, this is another pretty decent limited card. I'd be relatively happy to play this, especially in an aggressive build. Geist of the Lonely Vigil. Uh, this one I'm not as excited about. I mean, it is economical. It only costs two, and sometimes you are desperate to find two drops in limited. So don't get me wrong. It's very playable if you need a two drop. Um, but there's some better two drops out there, I'd say. Uh, it's a great blocker. It's great for slowing the game down, especially if maybe you're playing uh, Azorius Colors, for example, and you're trying to be a little more tempo-y, a little more grindy. Uh, this is probably a good card in that particular build. Uh, however, the downside is having a 2-3 kind of sitting there for a while is nice to slow down the game, but eventually what white is really trying to do is get more aggressive so it doesn't quite fit in with what white is trying to do overall as a color and that i guess feels a little awkward to me uh, so having said that definitely playable in the right builds in the right deck uh, but it's not always going to make your cut give no ground uh, this is another card that feels a little awkward to me uh, it's feels kind of like a fog but a fog where you have to have a creature and you're paying four <laughs> so this is kind of a sideboard card i think more than anything in limited if you find yourself up against that deck that is going super wide and has combat tricks and pump spells uh, then i would sideboard this in uh, but other than that i don't see myself running it in my original opening deck Guardian of Pilgrims. Uh, this is a bear with upside, so that's always good for you and limited. I mean, paying two for a 2-2, two, two, you'll be happy. Again, this is a good example of a fine two drop, and two drops are extremely important and limited, so you'll be happy to play this. And the fact that this also can buff itself for another creature, at least for the turn it enters the battlefield, is pretty good. 
Next we have Ironclad Slayer. Uh, this is a 3-2 for 3, so it has the right stats for limited. This is very limited playable. 3-2 for 3 is kind of par for the course. You're very happy to do that. Uh, and it has upside on top of it. When it does enter the battlefield, you might be able to get an aura or equipment from your graveyard back to your hand, which is great value when it happens. Might not always happen. Some decks will have more targets than others, right? So if you do happen to be playing some auras, maybe an equipment card, it makes it even more uh, likely that you'll run this. Won't always make your cut, but again, the stats are good enough for limited, no doubt, especially sealed. Now, having said that, I think this is kind of a nudge towards the future. And I think we're going to see more equipment spells, uh, especially some stronger equipment spells, I hope, <laughs> in the upcoming block. And who knows, maybe some good auras too are coming. Iron Rites Cleansing. Uh, this is going to be a sideboard card for you in limited. It's going to allow you to deal with a problematic artifact or enchantment. Nothing wrong with that. It's a little slower than the traditional disenchant naturalize effect, but this does exile, which is pretty important in this uh, environment with delirium and uh, cards that can do stuff from the graveyard. So it's actually pretty decent. And again, maybe it's a little bit of a nudge towards what's going to happen in the future. Lone Rider. So I've mentioned this card a couple times now because of its combo ability. And of course this turns into it that rides as one. But to do that you need to gain three life. So if you can gain three life this becomes an incredible card. This thing's a beater. So let's talk about limited first. If you have the ability to gain the life and you think you can get there, I'd run it and be pretty happy with it. If I don't have that ability all of a sudden it becomes a lot less exciting, right? So it might not make your cut if you don't think you can flip it. But if you can flip this thing, potentially run with it, you'll be very happy you did. Uh, standard, I think you can get there. Again, we saw the combo with Blessed Alliance is probably the most likely one. Uh, but yeah, I think with that card in play, this could see some standard play. It's just that good. Once you flip this thing, it only costs two, and then you have yourself a 4-4 four, four, first strike trample lifelink. It's just crazy. <laughs> so again, the rich get richer, white gets another great card, uh, and I think we're going to see this in the metagame for some time to come. Long Road Home. Uh, this is a blink effect, and it's nice if you're trying to save a creature, for example. So I could see myself running this in limited, or at least sideboarding it in if I'm up against maybe red or black. Uh, there's just a lot of removal, a lot of direct damage that you'll see in this set. So having said that, though, I was kind of hoping for more of a flicker enters the battlefield thing uh, in, in Estrad, kind of like we saw in Avacyn Restored. We didn't really quite get there. We saw a few, like, glimmers of it, or I guess maybe just a little bit of a throwback to Amazon Restored. But I hope in the future we do see something that focuses a little more on the flicker effects. So again, if you have targets for this that are good, or you're up against a deck with heavy removal, uh, it's definitely worth boarding it in, uh, but it's probably not always going to make your cut. Lunark Mantle. Uh, this one I really don't like. <laughs> Here's my issue with it. It's an aura. It's cheap. It only costs two, so I'll give it that. Gives the creature plus two, plus two, and that's good. Uh, I can pay another mana and sacrifice a permanent to give it flying. So, okay, now it has evasion. Seems like a good deal. Seems economical. But here's the issue I have with it. I play this for two. I tap the extra uh, mana land to get the one mana. Sacrifice a permanent. And then my opponent destroys it. And I basically just got three for one. <laughs> that doesn't feel good. <laughs> so, I just think it's too much of a risk for what it's doing. If it was a bigger reward, maybe. Like if it gave it 2-2 two, two and lifelink or something. But the reward doesn't outweigh the risk for me with this card. I just don't really see myself using it quite honestly. Uh, again, maybe it can enable Delirium if you need a way to get, say, a land in your graveyard or something like that. So there are some limited decks that might find a purpose for it. So don't get me wrong, it's not completely unplayable or anything. But uh, yeah, most of the time I'm probably going to avoid this one. It just feels like a trap. Peace of Mind. Uh, another limited card that's not super exciting but sometimes has a role. Basically, the role is this. If I have a Lone Rider and I want to gain three life to flip it, <laughs> this is a good card for me. If I need a discard outlet because I'm playing with maybe some Madness or I have a Delirium plan, this is a good card for me. If I'm not doing one of those two things, this is not a good card for me. So <laughs> I just know your deck. Obviously, there's a purpose for this card. If you need it, it's there for you. If you don't, it will sit in your sideboard. Next, we have Providence. And a couple things about this card. First off, I mentioned this when it was previewed, but I like the fact that they used a very simple name like Providence. I think that's awesome, but I felt it, it was a little weird that they used it on this card. You probably want to save it for a card that you're going to reprint a lot, and I don't feel like this is something that's going to be reprinted a lot. Uh, having said that, where do you play this card? 
um, it's really not that fantastic and limited because it's just awkward. Like, yeah, if I'm losing the game, let's say I'm at one life and I play this, I basically gain 25 life, but I also haven't changed the state of the game at all. I just bought myself a few more turns to hopefully stabilize, but I might not stabilize. I might just still lose the game, right? And I kind of lost the card draw that maybe would have top decked something that would have been more helpful. So I don't know. It's not unplayable and limited, especially if you're up against a super aggressive deck, like maybe a burn deck or a deck that has a lot of small creatures. It's just faster than what your deck is doing or faster than your pool. Then I could see myself boarding it in in a case like that. As far as constructed play goes, I don't really see it doing anything in standard. Uh, some people have kind of thought about, do you want this in a uh, sideboard matchup against a burn deck or a hyper aggressive deck and say a more powerful format like modern or something like that? I just think it's too expensive. Again, it does buy you a lot of time to do what you're trying to do. I mean, you can give up a lot of life before you get your engine going. That's kind of nice, but you also have to spend seven mana to do it. I think it's just a little too much. And I think gaining six life off the reveal is just not good enough. Um, talking about Commander, this is a card that's just plain not good in Commander <laughs> um, because most of the time you're at higher than 26 life. Uh, again, sure, it would help you out later in the game if you're behind, but again, does it really help you catch up or does it just buy you some more time? You know, So I, I don't know. This card feels like it probably has some sideboard applications out there somewhere, but uh, it's just not super exciting to me anyway for a rare. Repel the Abomination, and I actually kind of like this card. At first glance, it's like a fog, and you're like, why am I paying two for a fog? But if you look a little closer, it's a fog for non-human sources. So if you're playing all humans, you're getting a one-sided fog, and that can actually be quite good, especially in a matchup against, say, zombies or something like that. So I think this will be a sideboard card in standard, quite honestly, because I do feel like the zombie deck will be a thing. The human deck's going to still hang in there and <laughs> probably still dominate, to be honest. Uh, but this is a great card to deal with any decks that aren't humans, right? And uh, I like it. So this is going to be fine for you and limited as well, as long as you have a lot of human creatures and you're going up against non-humans. So again, it might be a sideboard card in some matchups, uh, but still could be quite good. Sanctifier of Souls. This was the white intro pack rare. And most of the time intro pack rares are good limited cards. And this one's no exception. I don't like paying four for a two, three. However, in the mid to late game, you get a lot of value here because you can pay three and just start exiling creature cards from your graveyard to get one, one flyers. And that actually could be good enough to turn the tide and deal with a stalemate. So I do like it. I'd be happy to play it in limited. Selfless Spirits, another good limited card. 2-1 flyer for 2. It's always very economical and very good and limited, especially in an aggressive build. And also, you put this on the board and you're going to have to make your opponent really think about some of their plays going forward. And I do like that a lot. That sits on the board and they know that at any given time, they can make all of their creatures indestructible. So it changes the way they play. It makes them kind of slow their roll and be a little more methodical. And if they slow down too much, you could take advantage of that. Uh, also, if you just happen to get rattle chains then that's a pretty nice combo too uh, granted they're both rare so you probably won't see that very often but if you do get that card you can also use this as a combat trick which could be pretty good too uh, so yeah i don't know if i see it necessarily in standard but a uh, fine limited card for sure sigarda's aid this one seems very very powerful to me and first off Let's go back a little bit and actually talk about modern. I think this could be modern playable just because I feel like someone's going to brew something out of this. It's cheap, it's easy to cast, and there's just so much good equipment available to you in modern, like the swords and all that stuff. I just feel like there's something crazy you could do with it there. Uh, I also think that eventually this might be a decent standard card. I mean, right now I don't think we have great auras and equipment to really make this special in standard, especially considering how fast the format is. Uh, but I do think post-rotation, as time goes on and we go into the next block, which will probably have some good equipment, this could actually become a very good card in standard. So keep an eye on it. I don't think it's going to happen today, but in the future, I think this will become standard playable. In limited, if you have some good targets for it, it's fine. It's not a big commitment at one mana. So if you feel like you have maybe a good piece of equipment, a few good auras that you'd like to be able to uh, put into play at instant speed and attach to a creature you might be able to find some value there. Not all decks, obviously. If you don't have enough targets, you don't want to run it. But if you're comfortable with the amount of targets you have, it will be good for you. 
So Guardian Priest, and this is a good limited card, again, as long as you're not up against a human draft deck, <laughs> but in all other cases, this can be pretty good. It deals with some of the Eldrazi, some of the big creatures that are in the limited environment, and who knows, if one of those Eldrazi end up finding their way into a standard deck, this could be definitely a good uh, card to combat that out of the sideboard as well. Special Reserves, uh, this is another strong limited card. Don't underestimate getting a couple 1-1 one -one flyers that can actually be quite good even for four at sorcery speed. I still think this is very limited playable. Steadfast Cathar, another good aggressive limited card. It costs two for 2-1, two which Okay, that doesn't feel great, but it attacks in as a 2-3, and there's just a lot of 2-power, 1-power creatures, especially when you start looking at all the zombie tokens all the stuff in this set, and because of that, I think it's worth running in limited. Subjugator Angel, another card that I'd say is just probably for limited. It's a little too expensive for anything else, costs 6. You get a 4-3 flyer, and it does tap down all your opponent's creatures, so this is a card that really could be a end game play for some of those wide token decks that you're going to see in limited so if you're able to play maybe nice orzov deck a lot of zombie creatures a lot of spirit tokens something like that this could be a way to end the game in those builds thalia heretic cathar now thalia is the real deal this is maybe one of the best cards in the set this has really caught my attention first off she's a three two with first strike for three great stats great fighter that's going to make her fantastic and limited obviously it's going to make her another good three drop for white and standard and i'm sure she's going to see a lot of standard play but then on top of that creatures and non-basic lands your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped that's an awesome tempo move for so many formats i mean this hits fetch lands and slows them down it takes out any sort of strategy we're trying to cheat creatures in for a quick attack like a sneak attack strategy for example this will see play in Legacy. This could see vintage play. I, I, I really think it has the legs to possibly even get there, even if it's just a sideboard card. Uh, this will see modern play, no doubt in my mind. Uh, this is going to be one of the big cards of the set, and probably have a nice little price tag attached to it, especially for foils. It might be a card if you can get foils cheap early on. You may want to look into that. Uh, tons of play. She's going to be everywhere. She is amazing. and and uh i didn't even start to talk about commander yet or anything like that she can even be a commander <laughs> um although i will say if you put her down you might have a target on your back in commander <laughs> but uh just amazing card not much more i can say about it thalia's lancers oh, this is a good limited card you get a four four for five with first strike so it's got a lot of legs and limited uh it searches for a legendary card so it's a tutor effect which is quite good, and that's really going to make this a nice commander card. Uh, because not only do you get yourself a good fighter, but you also are able to tutor. In commander, you can have a lot of crazy legendary cards, right? That's where this card, I think, will really shine. Uh, what's awkward about it is you might say, well, I could play this in standard and use it to search up Thalia. You could, but it is a 5-drop, and really, are you going to compete against Avacyn with this card. I kind of think Avacyn's going to take the five drop spot most of the time, right? Uh, so because of that, I don't see, see it getting a lot of play in standard, but uh, it does have its purposes. Great commander card and great limited card. Thraben Standard Bearer. Uh, this is a nice little one drop for limited. You get a one one for one, that's fine, but more importantly, you can pay two and tap to discard a card and get a human soldier token. And in the late game, if a game goes long, you have a stalemate, that can actually be quite good. You start drawing dead cards, you draw lands, and you can convert those into actual creatures in board state. And if you have a nice little pump spell, you might be able to get some work done with a card like this. So I do like it. It's not going to make all builds, obviously. It's going to be for the deck in Limited that wants to go wide again, probably Orzov. Uh, but it's still very good in that instance. All right, let's move on to some of the multicolor cards. And we have Campaign of Vengeance. This is an interesting card. This really wants to be in the dedicated go wide Orzov deck. <laughs> and if you're playing that in Limited, this will be a good card to run a one of of. Uh, it just gives you a little bit of value. There's definitely a sweet spot where you can have enough creatures to just attack in, whittle down your opponent with the attacks themselves, and hopefully finish them off with the combat damage. Uh, there's a nice sweet spot where this card works. It's a little awkward though sometimes if you're not in that super go wide strategy, if you're not fully committed to that strategy, this card might not be great for you because if I'm behind and I only have a few creatures, I play this but I can't really attack because I need my creatures to defend. And on the flip side, if I have a whole bunch of creatures running around and I'm attacking in and just 
killing my opponent anyway, then this is just a win more, right? So there's a sweet spot where this card's good. I play it in the go wide deck, but probably wouldn't touch it unless I really was all in on that strategy. Next we have Spell Queller. This one's interesting because I think when this was first previewed, I kind of felt like, oh, this is a good limited card, 2-3 Flyer, that's always good. You might be able to get a little tempo play on one of the spells your opponent's trying to cast. But then the more I thought about it, actually this is probably very standard playable as well, in like Bant decks, for example. So I think it could find a home there. Uh, but it is a good card regardless. I think it will get there in standard, and it will be very good for you in limited. And our last card of the day, Tamiyo, Field Researcher. Now, here's another card that's just crazy good. <laughs> this is another card that's the real deal. And let me tell you, I mean, she does everything. I mean, her plus one is all about getting card advantage and making her opponent really think about combat situations. Her minus two is all about defending herself and taking care of problematic non-land permanents, not just creatures, but not land permanents. And if you can get her to uh, use her ultimate, <laughs> Wow, I mean, <laughs> you basically get a emblem that gives you omniscience and you get to ancestral recall. That's nuts. Uh, here's another nice combo for perhaps Commander. If you play doubling season and then play her, you can play her and immediately uh, use her ultimate. <laughs> so there you go. Good luck trying to make that happen because I think that would be incredible too. Uh, having said that, yes, she's standard playable. Uh, Band decks will work her in because she's incredible and there's no reason not to. <laughs> I could see her in like Band Collected Company, for example. She'll fit in there just fine. Uh, as far as, as modern goes, I think she's good enough to maybe see some modern play. Uh, limited, of course she's great. The only thing you do have to consider is are you going to be able to cast her? So in draft, if maybe you open her, pick one, pack one, you have plenty of time to try to get some mana fixing to make her reliable. If you pick her up late in a draft, like pack three, uh, then it might be a little bit harder. Or if you're playing seal, then you don't have a really good way to get the colors you need. That's kind of sad because you'd hate to not play her just because she's so amazing. <laughs> Other than that, fantastic card. Play it. Get copies of this thing. Uh, she's going to be awesome. <laughs> so having said that, those are the cards for today. We're going to be back tomorrow with all of the blue cards. And like I said, we're going to work our way as the week goes on through this entire set. So, hey, as always, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks as always for watching. This video, like all my videos, was made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Even a donation of a dollar helps me to keep growing this community and creating better quality videos for all of you. Check out our Patreon page for exclusive giveaways and future goals for the channel. If you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the MTG news, spoilers, set reviews, product openings, or finance videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a good day.